back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy. Today, I am going to spend some time sharing my trip to the Shetland Islands for Shetland Wool Week. I thought you might be interested to know because of COVID, this is the first time in almost three years that I have left the United States. My husband and I were very concerned about this virus. We did get the bivalent booster two weeks before our trip, but I was determined to not be exposed to any germs in the airport terminal or on the airplane itself. Because what I've heard from other people is when they've gotten COVID, when they've traveled, it was kind of narrowed down to one of those two places. So I wanted to show you what I actually went through to go and come back and be COVID free. This is the apparatus that I've been wearing for the last several years. It's a portable HEPA filter, it goes over my head and it's battery operated, you can recharge the battery. And then there's a mask. So whatever air you're breathing in is being filtered. For the purposes of this trip, I became aware of an additional device that I could insert through my mask, which is this little disc that you see. I think the company is called SIP. Um, there's a cover. When you peel off this cover, this is still completely sealed. There's a, a membrane inside of here that has hash marks that you can pass a plastic straw through. So you can sip any beverage through that without interrupting the integrity of the mask. Before the trip, I purchased a dozen of these. They're 100 calories. It's a protein drink. Now, because you can't bring liquid through the airport, I've been using this collapsible water bottle just around town. Uh, whenever I go out for a walk, I always wanna have a little water with me. So I've had this for years. I can go into the restroom at the airport and put water in here once I get through security. So I was able to mix up several of these to hold me through the flight. I never took my mask off. And I'm back safe and sound. So it seems to have worked. While in Scotland, most of the time we tried to eat outdoors where we could. If we had to eat indoors, we tried to situate ourselves near an open window. And we've continued to be very diligent and very careful. Now, to get to the knitting and the trip, just quickly, I want to tell you about my works in progress. I have no finished objects. Before I left on the trip, you see me knitting this golf and uh, skating sweater or for the ring or the links. And I had the thing almost done. The front, the back, and both sleeves were knit. And when I put it all together, it wasn't fitting. It wasn't fitting to my satisfaction. So I've tried a couple of remedies. I knit an extra panel down each side. You can see it doesn't match up perfectly, but it's not too bad. And I was able to get it to fit, but the shoulders are too wide. Right now I've turned some extra fabric under my shoulder is here, but the fabric was coming out a little further. It's not a big padded shoulder look to the sweater. And also the sleeves, the sleeve cap, everything was just a little bit too tight. I tried to block it. This fabric, because of the floats in the back, is not a very stretchy fabric. It doesn't really give. It's 100% merino wool, but I blocked it kind of as much as I could. And I, I really needed like another couple of inches and I wasn't getting it. So epic fail for the moment. I intend to revisit this. I'm probably gonna take it apart. I'm almost certain that I'm going to, at least with the front, pull back 
to the underarm and re-knit this narrower and try again. I've already ripped out both of the sleeves from the shoulder down to about the elbow and I've re-knit one. So this is gonna be going on for quite a while longer. I'm sure you'll see it again. I'm a little sick of it at the moment. So you might not see it anytime soon. For my trip, however, I did need to have something to work on. And because I was going to Shetland, I thought something that resembled Shetland lace would be a good project. Now, because I intended to buy yarn on the trip, I didn't want to carry a lot of yarn with me. So I carried this comb, it's pretty lightweight. When it was full, it weighed 50 grams, plus the weight of the comb. And I started knitting myself a scarf. I haven't really knit scarves or shawls, just one for my husband, uh, one shawl for myself. So I had this yarn left over from the genie. Remember, the genie had nine colors in it. So I have nine different colors. I have leftovers in each. Um, this pattern is called Ibiza or the Spanish island. And I thought it kind of had an art deco vibe, a little geometric. You'll see more of this. I'll keep chipping away at it. It's a fairly complicated pattern. There's a lot of knitting and purling through the back loop. Every row, every stitch in every row is kind of like different. I would say it's one of the more complicated things that I've knit. So that's gonna take me a while. The genie is gonna play a prominent role in this episode because in Shetland at the Shetland Museum, they have the original of this sweater and I took a slew of pictures of it and I was there taking measurements through the glass case. And later on in this episode, I'll be showing you that. I thought it would be fun to share with you a lot of slides. I also took some footage to the extent that my cell phone camera would allow. And I'd like to share some of that with you. I'll be narrating some of it. I'll try and put some music under some of it to make it a little more fun for you. I hope you enjoy it. I've talked often before about how I don't buy yarn just to have stash. On this trip, people were teasing me, oh, Billy, you should take an extra suitcase because you're going to want to buy so much yarn. Well, I did visit some yarn shops, specifically in Shetland, two in particular, the really famous ones, Jameson's of Shetland and Jameson and Smith. The house that we rented was just a few doors down from Jameson and Smith. So of course I hit that. And we went on a tour, which you'll see later on in the video of Jameson's of Shetland's mill where the yarn is actually made. But we also visited their store in the center of town in Norwood. And in both instances, I found the Shetland wool to be very scratchy, very rustic. Um, Typically, they're knitting fair aisle, complicated patterns like this with steaking, which I also did here. And when you cut through your yarn, using Shetland wool is really beneficial because it doesn't unravel. I did have a hard time. I'll put a link to the episode where I show my steaking and how I reinforced it with crochet stitches and also a running stitch, but I ended up using fray check to make sure that the thing didn't unravel. Anyway, I just found the yarn to be too rustic for the type of knitting that I prefer to do. So I really didn't load up on yarn as I thought that I might. Here's what I did acquire. Um, Budge made right there in the Shetland Islands. There's a long story with this. Sometimes if you run into me in person, Hit me up for the story of the fudge. I bought my son a pair of socks that have boats because we were on a ferry boat. There's a lot of fishing that goes on in these areas. So boats are a, a real part of their lifestyle. These are made of bamboo. They're really soft. They're just wonderful. It's not that he needs socks, but I thought they were so cute. And I thought that they matched the yarn that I bought for him. 
while I was in Jameson and Smith, touching all of their yarns and finding everything to be scratchy, I did feel this, which is made for West Yorkshire spinners by them. This is called the Croft. I bought, I did buy a sweater's quantity because I do intend to make a sweater for our son. He has a sweater that he bought in the UK that's an Aran with all the cables and the diamond shapes and moss stitch or seed stitch. His zips up the front. He seems to really like it and he gets a lot of use out of it. So I thought I would do it. I thought I would try and re-engineer it in a completely different yarn. So you can see this has some really lovely speckles. The base is maybe like a beige and then it has brownish and bluish speckles in it. His eyes are blue and his hair is kind of like a auburn brownish color. Anyway, I thought these socks would be kind of cute with it or with anything else that he decides to wear. So that's the extent of my acquisitions. I know it's not much, but I am off to Rhinebeck next week. So maybe I can do a little more damage there. And as you've seen, I have some projects that are going to take me a while. So I'm not really looking to load up on yarn for future projects until I get to them. We were in both Edinburgh and Glasgow before we went on the ferry from Aberdeen to Lerwick and the Shetland Islands. I loved Edinburgh so much that I am seriously contemplating going again next year, not for Wool Week, but to bring other people with me who are interested in seeing Edinburgh and Glasgow. I feel I could give a pretty good tour. I've hit some of the high spots, some of the museums, university, the parliament, and, and a bunch of other tourist attractions, but really interesting, different things, different things than what I've seen in my other travels. So I'd love to share that with you. Comment below if that sounds like something that would interest you, or if you're on Instagram or Ravelry, you can private message me on either of those two platforms. I'll put my handle on the screen and you'll have it. Also, always in the show notes below, you'll find my contact information. It was a very beautiful sunny evening when we took off and I didn't want to forget to tell you a little hack that I think I've discovered. I wanted to have a very small crochet hook and my knitting needles in flight with me. And what I decided to do was to wrap them all in just a little bit of tin foil when I went through airport security. And I thought, it's just going to look like a ballpoint pen or something. Um, they're not going to suspect anything. It's different than having this showing. And it seems to have worked. So there's a little hack for the knitters out there. The rest of the video is going to be broken up into segments. I'm going to show you some architecture. I'm going to show you museums. I'm going to show you sweaters and fashion and a few other categories. So here we go.
kind of reminds me of our Lincoln Center in New York. It's a cultural complex here. Concert halls, theater. Greyfriars Bobby was a restaurant named for the Sky Terrier, Bobby, who belonged to John Gray, who was a night watchman for the Edinburgh police. The two were inseparable for two years. However, in February 1858, Gray died of tuberculosis. He was buried in Greyfriars Kirkyard, and Bobby, who survived him by 14 years, is said to have spent the rest of his life sitting on his master's grave. The gardener and keeper of Greyfriars tried on many occasions to evict Bobby, but in the end, they took pity on him. A shelter was built for him and he was fed regularly. He never spent a night away from his master's grave, even in the most dismal weather conditions. In 1867, the Lord Provost of Edinburgh paid for Bobby's dog license, making him the responsibility of the city council. Sadly, Bobby died in 1872. He couldn't be buried within the cemetery itself since it was consecrated ground. Instead, he was buried just inside the gate of Greyfriars Courtyard, not far from John Gray's grave. The Scottish Parliament building was designed by EMBT, a Barcelona-based firm, and their partners, RMJM Scotland. Lead architect Enrique Morales had a vision for a Parliament building that would reflect how we experience the landscape, and that would be part of a larger gathering place for people to meet. His concept design was for a building that fitted into the surrounding natural area, Hollywood Park, connecting it symbolically to all of Scotland. The building opened to the public October 9, 2004, at a final cost of 414.4 million pounds. Many of the architectural shapes were inspired by aspects of Scotland's built or natural environment or ideas about political values, such as consensus politics. There's a leaf design used in some of the lighting fixtures. And there's also a shape that's reminiscent of a man running, I believe. One of these slides shows these symbolic shapes. On the well-being of the staff. What we need is a clear plan to make the nursing and the curriculum and the caring care for young people to address the fitness we are seeing described as extremely worrying for nursing. So I asked the First Minister today, when will her government stop patting itself on the back, realise the scale of this recruitment problem and outline the detailed action it will take to address this The timing of our visit perfectly coincided with the reopening of Hollywood House after the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. The audio guide for visitors to the palace had already updated the timeline to include King Charles. These audio headsets were very interesting, really state of the art. I'd never seen any that were interactive you could swipe your hand over the screen and it would show you what the room looked like before it was painted and after it was painted. They also showed an x-ray of one of the paintings in the collection that's on display from Buckingham Palace. They showed the x-ray and then it morphs into what the painting looked like.
The Grocer Shop by Gerrit Du, painted in 1672 on a panel in oils, is what's considered a genre painting, a painting that depicts someone's profession. What's significant about this particular painting is that the objects are conveniently arranged along the stone ledge in the foreground, seeming to lean out of the painting and into the real world. It is as if the painting is itself a shop window. The 412 foot Royal Yacht Britannia, now decommissioned, was once headed by a Commodore or Admiral and his staff of up to 20 officers and 220 yachtsmen. Objects designed by Glasgow native Charles Rennie McIntosh. He designed furnishings for tea rooms. Sewer Cranston was a clever property investor. Like his sister, he opened tea rooms on key city streets. Catherine, his sister, became his greatest business rival. Miss Cranston favored modern design. She established four of the largest tea rooms in the city and made sure each was uniquely decorated and furnished. Through hard work, reputation, and flair, she became the recognizable face of Glasgow Tea Rooms. She chose to wear dresses that were about 30 years out of date. This old-fashioned image helped brand her business as one of traditional quality. Survey 
his undertaking to enable the peace to be assembled. Ontarian owns this Rembrandt from 1639 to 1641. It's oil on an oak panel, and the tag says it's called the Entombment. The Prince of Orange ordered a whole passion series, and this panel was begun at that time. The current thinking is that this very sketchy painting was deliberately left unfinished as an example of the master's improvisatory way of working. His 1656 insolvency inventory shows that Rembrandt kept it in his private living room where only special guests would see it. Another famous Glaswegian, Robert Louis Stevenson, author of Treasure Island, was the grandson of Robert Stevenson. Robert Stevenson and his father-in-law built the Inchkeith Lighthouse in 1803 to protect shipping coming into the port of Leith. The dioptic lens that you see here was designed by relative David A. Stevenson in 1889 for that lighthouse. The lens was in use at Inchkeith Lighthouse until 1985 when the last lighthouse keeper was withdrawn and the light was automated.
the first knitting machines were used to make socks. Later, larger machines were used for making garments. The machines were hand-operated and were suitable for use by home knitters in the days when most of Shetland had no electricity. As the demand for knitwear increased, knitting gradually became mechanized. are all hand knits from the 1920s and 30s and there's a lovely little sign here that explains how these things were hand knit by Elizabeth Angus and her mother sorry Elizabeth Angus's mother Elizabeth Sinclair and her aunt Harriet Tullock who are pictured right here some of these garments were entered in knitting competitions and Harriet's most spectacular win was 50 pounds, which took them to Edinburgh in 1930 on holiday. So first we have a child sweater and another darling child sweater and matching leggings. And then some things for women, all Fair Isle. These are the first vintage knits and knits that I've seen in Scotland. I've only been here several days, but this is an extraordinary display, as you can see. And there's a scarf and matching hat. The shop is just adorable. Sunday, everything in the town seems to be shut tight. But I'll be back in days to come to bring you more. This letter in the Shetland Museum written to Mrs. Pottinger of Shetland reads, Dear Madam, Sir Ernest Shackleton at present is in New Zealand, but I am waiting for him here and was second in command of the expedition. I am very pleased to be able to say that the woolen goods you shipped to us were excellent in every way, were comfortable, wore well, and were easily washed. 
Yours truly, Frank Wilde. On March 5th, 1922, Sir Ernest Shackleton's funeral was held in South Georgia. A hundred Norwegian and British whalers were in attendance. The six pallbearers were Shetlanders from Lerwick. All served in the First World War and found employment in the dangerous and difficult job of whaling in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Not fit for the human body, lest it be worn as a cloak, because it was so itchy and it was of mixed quality. And that's very important to remember, mixed quality. He said that sheep resembled the Spelsow and Bailsow of Scandinavia, and possibly, most likely, was brought over by the... In his report, he says there were some kindly wolf sheep. <laughs> kindly very, very fine wool sheep. This sheep, he said, was so valuable, they were, a lot of them were hidden away, and if you, if you recall the price of wool up until the mid-1950s was the cash crop in the
National Museum of Scotland has an entire section devoted to fashion. Here are a few excerpts. Originally, purple dye was obtained from a tiny sea snail found in the Mediterranean Sea and was worth more than its weight in gold. It took more than 9,000 shellfish to produce one gram of dye, making it so expensive to produce that purple dyed textiles were associated with the emperors of Rome, Egypt, and Persia. In the early 1960s, Burnett Klein produced a range of groundbreaking woven women's wear fabrics seen here, which featured bold color effects and unexpected combinations of materials, such as velvet ribbon with brushed mohair. Klein experimented for many years to perfect a technique called space dyeing, which allowed a single cloth to contain multiple colors. His breakthrough into the European couture market came when his mohair tweed fabric was chosen by Coco Chanel for her spring 1963 collection. Other couture houses, including Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, and Hardy Amy's also used Klein's luxurious textiles in their designs. By integrating 3D printed nylon elements with hand-knitted construction, this Pringle of Scotland design combines the traditional with the cutting edge to create a play on textures. During the 1930s and 40s, Elsa Scaparelli was collaborating with surrealist artists Jean Cocteau, Salvador Dali, and Leonor Fini. Her work from this period cemented her reputation for theatrical designs, marrying art and dressmaking with whimsical detailing, bold prints, and eye-catching embroidery. The jacket shown here is similar to the one that Scaparelli herself is wearing in this gelatin silver print by Horse P. Horse from 1934. 